thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Please keep yourselves muted tonight. It's much easier if everyone's on mute and we can um, hear Ron when he speaks. Um, and also please on the sidebar, if you have any questions while Ron is speaking, can you write them down? We're gonna do everything in our power to um, pass them on and I'll read them out and Ron can answer them. We're here this evening to try and understand just what the current situation in Israel is all about, where it's likely to go and what option Israel has. I know on the ground in Israel and post COVID, the rocket attacks have terrorized and traumatized children and adults alike, forcing daycare centers, schools and villages to close once again, forcing people back home, forcing all their offices, workplaces, all of the children to be in their environments that are often less than adequate. The destruction and trauma to Israelis right now is horrifying. I want to assure you all that while a large number of our WITSO projects and institutions were closed last week, that WITSO continued to serve thousands of Israelis, especially the most vulnerable ones. Shelters were opened for those that were, that were needed and food packages were put together and delivered. Our deep concern now, of course, is the recent wave of anti-Semitism around the globe. Anti-Semitic hate that continues to flood the internet. We are all on the front line and that is what brings us here this evening. We are one family with a shared history, shared values and shared destiny. We stand together to protect our homeland for in protecting Israel, we are protecting the Jewish people. I would now like to hand over to Ronnie Bogner OAM who will introduce Ron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Di. Oh, sorry, close. Uh, it is Wietso's great pleasure to once again welcome Dr. Ron Weiser to our format tonight so that he can share his vast knowledge to inform and educate us on what is actually happening in Israel. We need to know so that we can understand the facts and we can speak confidently about Israel. Ron has always supported all of Wietso's activities. In fact, he is an honorary WITSO member. This year, we were very proud to award Ron the inaugural Rose Fekater Community Hero Award to acknowledge his, his services to WITSO and the wider community. I'd like to read you a little bit about Ron. His CV is massive. I'm only going to read a little bit to you. Ron is a member of the Board of Governors of the Sochnut, the Jewish Agency, Life Member of the Zionist Federation of Australia Executive, Honorary Life President of the Zionist Council of New South Wales, a Founding Director of Y2I Project, 10, Project Year 10 for Israel, a Founding Director of the Onlight Hate Prevention Institute, and in 1910, Ron was awarded the NAM, 2010, sorry, services, sorry, Ron was awarded an AM for his services to the community through his leadership roles with the Zionist Federation of Australia. Ron, welcome. I um, hand over the screen to you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Please excuse my voice. I'm recovering from a, clue, uh, a cold, a flu, had a COVID test, so I'm all okay. Um, I'm going to do what I normally do uh, on these WITSO talks, which is to present a PowerPoint. During the PowerPoint, I won't be able to see the chat questions, so people can still put the questions in and then we'll try and get to them after that. Um, and uh, I can't promise that I can do what Di said and that is answer the questions, um, but we can at least discuss the questions and uh, see where we go. So you should all be able to see in a moment the screen. Coming up there, slideshow from the camera. Okay, so the first thing I would say is that I never know uh, how Israelis come up with these names. Um, Operation Guardian of the Walls, it doesn't seem to fit to anything, um, but nevertheless, that's what it is. Luckily, nobody seems to be using it, but um, that's what it's called. So we're gonna try and discuss a little bit, uh, work out where it is that we stand. 
And I want to say that the Middle East is complex. You need to have a proper understanding of the issues before you can know and prioritize what to emphasize and what to simplify. I get so many requests for people saying, just give me a sentence. It just doesn't work like that. There are no quick answers. And sometimes you're going to be uncomfortable. Um, but even if you don't know something, don't make it up. Because as long as we can maintain our credibility, even when people disagree with you, they'll respect you and they'll still come back to you. And at the end of it all, <clears throat> no amount of PR, regardless of its quality, can counter anti-Zionism and its true root, which is, of course, anti-Semitism. So let's just see if we can frame the conflict. I'm not going to go back through 100 years of history, but let's see if we can just see what we've got in the two sides here. The Hamas Charter, and you really need to listen to what Hamas says, because when they talk about their aims, they're telling the truth. So in their preamble, they say Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. And in all of their anti-Israel and anti-Jewish demonstrations, and they are anti-Jewish demonstrations, they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Of course, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, there'll be no state of Israel whatsoever. Juxtapose that with Israel's position, which has always been and continues to be about some form or other of a two-state solution. And I'm just gonna give you dates of a few examples when this, of course, uh, has happened from the original partition plan after the Six Day War in Oslo, Camp David, dare I say in 2005 when Sharon took Israel out of Gaza, completely left it, no Israeli troops, no Israelis living at all in Gaza, 2008, Ahmed and Annapolis, and even the Trump plan. Now, the Trump plan, which was less generous to the Palestinians, was essentially still a two state solution. Now, you have these two opposing sides. One side is a to total position with no chance of compromise, and the other side is for a compromise. And in case you're in any doubt about the anti Semitic nature of it, Hamas are very clear. It's not just about Zionists. So, Article 7 of the Hamas Charter, you can Google these things on the, just look up the Hamas Charter. But the hour of judgment shall not come until Muslims fight the Jews and kill them so that the Jews hide behind the trees and stones, and each tree and stone will say, oh, Muslim, oh, servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Uh, or Article 22, which I expanded into a Hamas leaf, but which is repeating the protocols of the elders of Zion. The Jews, it's, again, not the Zionists, it's predating the state. The Jews took behind, stood behind World War I so as to wipe out the Islamic Caliphate. The Jews stood behind World War II, where they collected the immense benefits from trading with war materials. And here's the ultimate irony, the Jews inspired the establishment of the United Nations as a Security Council in order to rule the world by their intermediary. And I love cartoons because good cartoons will express the whole thing. This is from 2014. That's John Kerry, Vivian and Hi. And you can see, somebody's not on mute. You can see that the cartoon is showing Hamas's position, death to all Jews, and John Kerry saying to Vivian and Fernando, could you at least meet him halfway? We don't have anything to offer Hamas that Hamas is willing to accept. That's the basic issue between us and Hamas. And that cartoon expresses that beautifully. So the current crisis is actually not about anything that they talk about in the press. It's an intra-Arab dispute where Israel is merely the collateral damage. It's essentially about two elections and about two Abbasas. Now, in the Middle East, Abbas is a common name, like in Australia, Smith. And these two Abbasas are not related, but it's about these two Abbasas. So the first one is the Palestinian politics. Mahmoud Abbas, elected in 2005 for a four-year term, cancelled every other election since, was about to go to elections right now. And he cancelled the elections. And he cancelled the elections for one simple reason, and that is because he knew he wasn't going to win it and he was worried that Hamas would win. So basically, here you have Hamas about to go into what it saw as a leadership position. All of a sudden, Mahmoud Abbas canceled the elections. Hamas had to do something to show leadership and that it was the true leaders of the Palestinian people. That's the first one. The second one is actually the Israeli elections. And Hamas doesn't care whether it's Netanyahu or Lapid or Bennett, all the same to them. But at the bottom, you can see with the least number of seats leading the Israeli Arab party called Ram is Mansour Abbas. Now, Mansour Abbas only has four seats, but he's a potential kingmaker in the formation of a government in Israel. 
And you have to remember that until this point in time, never has an Israeli Arab party formally joined any government. Now, Mansour Abbas is a dentist, and those of you who know I'm a dentist, uh, that's about all we have in common, but we know that dentists are very pragmatic people. And the Palestinian Arabs, uh, Israeli Arabs, Palestinian Israelis, they're searching for their identity. Um, Ayman O'Day uh, was the head of the joint group of Israeli Arab parties. Only in this last election did Mansour Abbas split off. O'Day got six seats, Mansour Abbas got four seats. And it's amazing how leftists try to describe the 20% of Israel that are uh, Arab as Palestinian Israelis. But they really want to be Israeli Arabs. And it's a huge difference in meaning between those two concepts. So Mansour Abbas, he comes from what's called, he comes from what's called the Southern Islamist movement. He lives in the north of Israel. The northern Islamist movement is banned in Israel, but the southern Islamist movement is headed by Mansour Abbas. You need to understand that this is a fundamentalist Islamist movement whose ideological roots are the Muslim Brotherhood, exactly the same as Hamas. Hamas and Mansour Abbas come from the same source. But Mansour Abbas has been taking a very, I think, positive and brave position of now looking at the two biggest problems for Israeli Arabs in Israel. One is the high rate of organized Arab crime in Israeli Arab towns, with the Israeli police afraid to enter because, of course, then it would look like Jews beating up Arabs and so on and so forth. And he wants that cleaned up, as most mayors of Israeli Arab towns want that cleaned up, and a better shake, a fairer deal of the infrastructure spent from Israel to improve the daily life. And he made, just before this uh, bout of fighting, the most amazing speech. And this is part of it. Now is the time for change. I carry a prayer of hope and the search for coexistence based on mutual respect and genuine equality. What we have in common is greater than what divides us. I am Mansour Abbas, a man of the Islamic movement. I'm a proud Arab and Muslim. And here it comes, a citizen of the state of Israel who heads the leading biggest political movement in Arab society. It's an amazing statement from somebody who comes from the Muslim Brotherhood ideology is gone. Here we are. I want to be part of the state of Israel, get a better shake here, Israeli Arabs. And this is the worst thing that Hamas could ever hear. Cooperation and coexistence with the state of Israel, recognition of the state of Israel, etc. This is the main impetus of the current issues. So the current situation, we got to distinguish, especially in the PR campaign, between the triggers and the real cause. Unfortunately, then we had a perfect storm of triggers that happened all together. So number one, it was the end of Ramadan. Um, Israeli soldiers went onto the Temple Mount. They were stoned. There was a fight. Uh, it's a perfect trigger. Yom Yerushalayim, which happens every single year, the reunification of Jerusalem from 1967. There was a flag parade um, that Hamas called, uh, you know, an incentive to the rockets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, notwithstanding that Netanyahu cancelled the parade. Also, we have the Gregorian calendar um, date of, 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 Israel, of Yom Atzimut, of Israel Independence Day, May the 14th, followed May the 15th by what uh, some Palestinians call Nakba Day, the, you know, the day of the tragedy and the disaster. All this is happening at the same time. And the biggest trigger of all is really a facade. The High Court in Israel, which is quite liberal, had approved the eviction of some six families from a suburb in Jerusalem called Sheikh Jarrah. The Jewish name for the suburb is Shimon Hatzadi. We need to understand that in the War of Independence, Jewish people were expelled from their homes, not just from their homes, but expelled and pushed over the Green Line uh, by the Jordanian troops. And squatters, Arab squatters, moved into their homes uh, in Sheikh Jarrah. Now, the High Court over the years has done an amazing, an amazingly um, liberal, if you like, decision. And that was even if those squatters had been in some of those houses, but were able to claim title to them through Jordanian law, those uh, houses could no longer be claimed under Israeli law by the original owners. But for those houses that had not had title taken away by the Jordanians, where Jewish families could prove ownership of the property, the High Court of Israel gave them 
ownership of the property, but not the ability to live in them. In other words, the squatters, the, the Arabs who had moved in, were able to stay in those homes, provided they continued to pay a peppercorn rental. 20 years ago, they stopped paying that rental. It's taken 20 years for the High Court to go through the process to say that these families need to be evicted from that, or can be evicted from their homes so that the original owners can claim them. And you've got to understand, it's an eviction, it's not an expulsion. They can rent another place in Sheikh Jarrah. They do not have to leave Sheikh Jarrah. They do not have to go to leave the state of Israel. And so this was turned into another trigger and we get diverted by these triggers and we shouldn't. Because at the end of the, the, the day, the main game are the two elections. Hamas needing to demonstrate its leadership because it couldn't by election. So by, by showing it led the resistance. And of course, stopping Mansour Abbas to join an Israeli government. And the ultimate aim of Hamas is the destruction of Israel by, mean, by one means or another. And we just have to keep that in mind the whole time. So I think another thing that demonstrates the righteousness of what Israel is doing at the moment is that notwithstanding all the divisions in Israel, there's a unity of purpose in dealing with this. There's a left-right consensus in Israel that what, is, what had to be done was being done. And in fact, the only point of contention is that everybody is jumping on Bibi Netanyahu for being too weak, either not bombing enough, uh, not keeping the war going another couple of days so that more of a Hamas could be degraded. I mean, as always, Netanyahu is the most cautious leader. And as always, he's going to take um, the least controversial and the least confrontational approach. And you can read those quotes, but basically, I'll, I'll return to this a little bit later as well. Now, the biggest long-term fallout is what happened and what Hamas managed to instigate is the violence that took place inside Israel between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. We're not talking about Palestinians now, we're talking about Israeli Arabs and uh, Israeli Jews. And that poses a bigger threat to the country than the military conflict with Gaza. And that is an existential threat to Israel. President Rivlin said, violent disturbances we saw are a genuine threat to Israeli sovereignty. Our home is on fire and we don't have another one. And it was going both ways, Jew on Arab, Arab on Jew. Nothing justifies Jews attacking Arabs or Arabs attacking Jews, said Prime Minister Netanyahu. And ultimately, what will happen with this picture is probably what's going to determine whether um, Hamas was more successful or less successful. There's a lot of political fallout. We still can't form an Israeli government because Mansour Abbas would look rather uh, like a traitor to the people if during this conflagration he tried to join the Israeli government, although very bravely he did two things. One is he said, whilst the missiles are flying, we cannot discuss it. So he didn't close it off completely. And in the mixed Israeli uh, Jewish Arab town of Lod, for instance, he went to visit the mayor of the town and to condemn the rioting that took place. So it's also caused an internal crisis for Bibi because many in the Likud are very dissatisfied with how he stopped it too soon and didn't take enough action. Nobody knows where Bennett's going. He's going left, right. So we don't know what is the political future of Mansour Abbas and what is the political future of Mahmoud Abbas. The world is still preferring Mahmoud Abbas to, uh, to uh, Hamas. And that may be his only saving grace in terms of his own political career. Now Hamas achieved all of its aims early on in the peace and wanted to cease fire sooner. And Israel didn't allow the ceasefire and America under President Biden gave Israel cover by not allowing resolutions to come to the Security Council on three separate occasions. Um, and when Netanyahu asked for 48 hours more, Biden gave him that 48 hours. But let's look firstly at Hamas's aims. And you can see the, 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 the catch 22 that Israel is in. So number one was to take the Hamas's aims to show and take leadership of the Palestinians and to defend Jerusalem. Hamas had never really done much about Jerusalem because of the triggers. And that's why, by the way, their first missiles for the first time were lobbed on Jerusalem, was to show Palestinians that not only were they the true leaders of the Palestinians, but they were the defenders of Jerusalem. To show that Hamas can terrorize Israelis and kill Israeli citizens. So they didn't care whether they Jew or Arab or foreign worker. I mean, we were all surprised, and Israel was surprised by Hamas's ability to launch the number of rockets it did and how far those rockets could fly, far greater capability than in 2014. To win the PR war by the deaths of its own people, we need to be understanding that we're facing an enemy 
that glorifies the deaths of its own people, the martyrdom, and the more Palestinians that die, the greater the PR victory, because then the moralizers in the world start talking about, you know, how many people died on one side and how many people died on the other, as if that's how you work out who's right and who's wrong. They set out to stop Mansour Abbas from joining an Israeli government. So for the moment, that's successful. And the big one is to divide Israel internally and cause a mini civil war whose damage will last for years. It, take, it took years to come to the position where coexistence, um, overt coexistence, and that's going to be damaged. And if anybody's in doubt that that is the main trigger of what took place, you just have to read what Hamas leader Haniya said directly after the ceasefire. He says, this battle has destroyed the project of coexistence with the Israeli occupation of the project normalization with Israel. And I don't think many people really uh, take this point as being as central as it is. And on the other hand, if we look at Israel's strategic aim, it's only got one aim. It doesn't want to have regime change. It doesn't want to go back in and reoccupy Gaza. It's merely to degrade Hamas's military ability as much as possible and to buy as long and as meaningful a ceasefire as is achievable. The last time was 2014 of a serious um, uh, face-off, uh, relative to seven years of almost relatively lack of missiles, although the odd missile in between. Um, and when Israel's aim is merely to delay and just to um, get into a better position defensively, whereas the other side doesn't really care, um, that is the strategic imbalance, if not the military imbalance. Israel doesn't have a military ability issue, it's got a political issue. So, you know, in public relations, they focus on the triggers, but these are just a diversion. And we need to focus on the underlying cause. And we get dragged into their argument time and time again. And we have to most importantly emphasize Hamas's self-declared aim. They focus on the number of deaths, and we need to focus on the reasons why. But we lose the public relations battle when we let them control the narrative. And that is one of the hardest things to do because it's our natural reaction to be reactive. And some of the things we just have to let pass and be proactive in getting our aims and our messages across. So I thought I would just cover a few possible talking points. Um, one is empathy. This is whether you're on social media or meeting with politicians or journalists, what would any normal country do in this situation? What would you want your government to do? It's not sympathy, it's empathy. You want the people you're talking to to feel like Bondi Beach is getting uh, miss uh, attacked by missiles. What would people in Bondi expect to happen? To tell the story of the bully. Hamas starts to fire the rockets and only scream for help and play the victim once Israel hits back. Gazans have the simplest, this was a, I, took, I lifted this out of an Israeli newspaper. Gazans have the simplest, cheapest, and most effective iron dome in the world. It's called stop shooting. If Hamas stopped attacking, Israel will not have to fire a single missile into Gaza. Our PR failure is that they started it and we're being blamed. So that's something that we have to try and overcome. Now, the other thing is, of course, Hamas is carrying out double, two war crimes, a double war crime. One is aiming its rockets at the civilian population, Jews and Arabs. And the other one is storing and firing its rockets from behind its own civilian population, including schools, hospitals, mosques, using them as human shields. Both of those are war crimes. There's just no question about that. And here's another cartoon, which, Again, as I said, I like these cartoons. This cartoon tells the story very well. You know, they're sheltering behind their missiles. They're using people to um, cover their missiles. Um, and we're using missiles uh, to protect our people. That's a very good cartoon. So the next th talking point is the extraordinary measures Israel takes to minimize civilian casualties. And that's a hard argument to put forward, but there's a lot of truth to what you're going to see now, and it's important to remember. This is not at the end of the war, but a little bit before, um, from an editorial from the Jerusalem Post. Approximately 60 of the dead are civilians. Now, some of them were likely filled by Hamas's own rockets because a third of their missiles landed inside the Gaza Strip on their own people. And every life lost is a tragedy without doubt. We know that. But think about this. Over a 1,000 bombs were dropped in Gaza on over a thousand targets and 60 civilians were killed. You've got to be careful because if you start saying only 60 civilians, you get involved in a semantic debate. 
But 60 civilians, that's never been done in war before. No other army has managed to drop a thousand, uh, to, tar to target a thousand targets with such minimal uh, casualties amongst civilians. It's really something that we need to hammer home. And we're so lucky because our friends, and I say that in inverted commas, UNRWA, the United Nations own organization, its own Gaza director said this, I have the impression there is a huge sophistication in the way the Israeli military struck over the 11 days. Yes, they didn't hit, with some exceptions, civilian targets. It's unheard of that the United Nations head of welfare in Gaza makes this statement. You'll find out what happened to him in a minute, but this is just unheard of. And he went on further to say that whilst at least a thousand residential units were destroyed during Operation Guardian of the Walls, there is no current shortage of medicine, food or water. And why is that? It's because even during the 11 days, Israel continued to deliver material through the crossings, even when Hamas attacked and killed one soldier that was transferring um, welfare and aid to the people in Gaza. Now, of course, this uh, Gaza director, uh, who was only speaking the truth, uh, they then called in uh, Hamas and the, the Gazans called for his uh, resignation, and he's been issuing apologies uh, for what he said. But it doesn't take away from the truth of what this person said, and he's no friend of Israel's. I think another important message is that Iron Dome also protects the people in Gaza. If not for Iron Dome, God forbid there would have been so many more casualties on Israel's side, and no Israeli government would have been able to show the restraint that Israel showed, and Israel showed restraint. And the last point, I think that's also a talking point, because many people, when they want to hit Israel in a public relations sense, say, look, it's just Netanyahu, or it's the right, or it's the left, whatever. In Israel, this is not a left-right issue. There's unity in Israel, and I return to that point that I mentioned earlier. And to finish off, I want to finish off on a high note because most of you, and I know with my own kids and everybody, is de becoming depressed by social media. Social media is a new phenomenon in our battles and it's an echo chamber. It will eventually have some impact on policies, uh, no doubt about it, but the biggest impact currently is depressing ourselves and the amount of hate that takes place on it and you know all of that. So I want to give you something that's changed and why, at least at this point in time, a lot of positive things have happened um, in terms of diplomatic cover. And I wanna make a point about this. President Obama was extremely good with Israel on military and intelligence aid. In fact, Iron Dome is because of Obama and the Americans paid for Iron Dome when Israel didn't wanna manufacture it, but he was hopeless on diplomatic cover. And there's no, you can't use your military power if you don't have diplomatic cover. Now, we have a new president of the United States. He's got a very troublesome element within his own party and nobody really knew he wasn't that interested in the Middle East. Um, we didn't know what he would do. Um, and he has, at least till this point in time, proved to be um, very, very good. Now, it's not all bad. And that's the point I wanna make. This is Aust the Austrian chancery. Now, this is the home of Hitler. Right? You can see there's the EU flag, the Austrian flag, and the Israeli flag. This is the, the Chancellor of Austria. Today was used as a sign of solidarity with Israel. The Israeli flag is hoisted on the roof of the federal chancery. The terrorist attacks on Israel are to be condemned by the, in, in the strongest. Together, we stand by Israel's side. Now, that's not bad. That's pretty damn good. Nancy Pelosi, who's the head of, I've just picked a few examples. Nancy Pelosi, who's the, of course, the Speaker of the House, but the leading Democrat uh, in the United States, other than the President. And look how these people all know where to put the blame. Hamas exploited a volatile situation to initiate hostilities against Israel, launching more than 3,000 rockets. And as always, Israel has a right to defend herself. Pelosi says in the statement, calling Israel our friend and ally. Now, the um, ceasefire came into effect on Friday morning at 2 a.m. On Thursday night, an organization, some of you may or may not have heard of, it's an organization of American states. Um, they designated Hamas as a terror group. This is prior to the ceasefire. The Organization of American States and International Coalition of 35 countries in North and South America 
designated Hamas a terrorist organization amid Israel's worst battle fighting with Gaza's Islamic rulers in years. This is their statement. The recent attacks launched by Hamas against the Israeli civilian population undoubtedly constitute attacks of a terrorist nature, the Uruguayan Secretary General said. Hamas's terrorist aggression is unlimited and always seeks civilian victims, seeks to escalate conflict dynamics and armed actions, as well as sowing terror among innocent pop populations, be they Israeli or Palestinian. And now this is in Israel before the ceasefire, the night before the ceasefire. The German foreign minister, the Czech foreign minister, the Slovakian foreign minister come to Israel. They fly to Israel while, whilst the rockets are still going to express their support for Israel. And this is what the German foreign minister says. Germany stands with Israel and it's right to defend itself, Musk said, ahead of a meeting with Gabi Ashkenazi. I came to Israel to show solidarity and support Israel after the rocket fire from Gaza. Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel's security and that of the Jewish residents here are not negotiable. And I think on social media, what we need to put out is a lot of these types of statements. Because when countries around the world, democratic countries around the world, are all supporting Israel, including Australia, then that also sends a message to people. And here's President Biden after the ceasefire. When asked about possible growing opposition within his party to ongoing support for Israel, Biden replied, my party still supports Israel. Let's get something straight. Until the region says unequivocally they acknowledge the right of Israel to exist as an independent Jewish state, there will be no peace. I highlighted an independent Jewish state because only three presidents have used that term. When Sharon got out of Gaza in 2005, it was preceded by an exchange of letters between Sharon and President Bush, George W, in 2004. And those letters between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel guaranteed that Israel would be an independent Jewish state. Now, until that point in time, America had never said that. They spoke about the state of Israel, but an independent Jewish state has huge connotations. And it's one of the things that Sharon gained in exchange for the disengagement from Gaza. Um, and now Biden has repeated that. That is, as I see it, huge. He says, there is no shift in my commitment to the security of Israel, no shift period. But what we still need is a two-state solution. It's the only answer. And of course, Biden also committed to resupplying Israel with missiles and to resupplying Israel with material for Iron Dome. So the question is, where do we go from here? Um, you know, in 2006, there was a war uh, with Lebanon uh, or in Lebanon with Hezbollah. At the time, uh, the Prime Minister was Echad Ahmed, and people thought that war was a failure. Um, but there's been quiet on that northern front since 2006. And a question we need to ask ourselves is, why did Hezbollah not join in this round of missiles? And why did Iran, who's pulling the puppet strings on that, not instruct Hezbollah to do so? And Many people in argue, because, argue in Israel that the deterrence of uh, what Israel has managed to do in 2006, which wasn't appreciated at the time, um, was actually greater than we thought. And there are some people arguing now, and I'm no security expert, that Israel did what it could from the air and without any actual ground invasion. It got that extra 48 hours from Biden uh, to do what it thought it could do. It hit its range of targets, and perhaps the damage to Hamas will be enduring. One of the things we do know is that one of the determinations of Biden and Blinken, the Secretary of State, um, is that the aid that will come to rebuild Gaza will go through the Palestinian Authority and not through Hamas. In a practical sense, I'm not sure how they will achieve that, but it tells you that everybody understands that the problem is Hamas. Uh, and I think that that is something that's not appreciated at the uh, social media level and something that we can take great comfort from at the leadership of the free world understands that very well. And I'll finish off just with the last thing. Um, there's my email address and you can write that down if you want and I'll tell you why. Um, tomorrow night on Q&A, there's going to be a session on the Middle East with no Jewish panelists. Um, the closest thing we have to a strong supporter will be Dave Sharma, he'll be on the panel. But one particularly um, effective um, proponent of the uh, Hamas or Palestinian cause is Randa al Fata. Now, she's a uh, erudite um, female who, as I said, she's erudite, she speaks very well. Um, in 2014, 
Um, I had a 12 and a half minute debate with her on Triple M uh, on a program called The Grill. Um, and if anybody wants to watch Q&A and get prepared for perhaps to see what her position will be, the sorts of things she'll say, that debate could have taken place tomorrow. It, it, nothing changed since 2014. Uh, and if you send me an email, um, I'll happily send you a copy of that debate. Um, and it's to help you prepare for the Q&A because even if you're not present, you can email in questions and so forth. So at that point, I'm going to stop the share and we'll see what you people have to say. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, okay, so I have a question from Edie Smith, um, who's just obviously saying how amazing you are. But the question is, um, given that Hamas is a recognised terrorist organisation, is any entity in the Western world discussing putting some intervention in Gaza to try and bring down Hamas? And what do you think Donald Trump would have done differently if he was still in office? No and nothing is my answer. <laughs> um, the, the, nobody, I mean, it, let's put it this way. If Israel wants to bring down Hamas and pay the price of doing so, with, with Israeli casualties and a bad PR, it can do it. But the question is, what then? So unless you're willing to go back into Gaza and stay in Gaza, Right? You have no alternative. And what Israel needs more than anything else is for there not to be a vacuum, because a vacuum uh, you know, means that you're going to have chaos, and chaos on the border is just something that can't be altered. Now, we have to understand when it comes to President Trump that he, was, he did a lot of fantastic things for Israel, uh, but it wouldn't have made any difference to see the president today for the simple reason that a lot of the problems we're seeing and which turns into a positive for Israel, is the similarity between Obama and Trump on some aspects of Middle East policy. Now, when it came to Obama, he may, kept making statements, you know, if the Syrians cross a red line, you know, we're going to intervene, and he never intervened. They were just empty threats. And unfortunately, uh, although Trump did amazing things in terms of jumping over the Palestinian issue with the Abraham Accords, which was all Trump, and the Americans paid for that, and that's enduring, survived this crisis, fantastic. But the negative was that Trump also had a policy called America First. Uh, and that was that Americans were no longer going to either fund their allies or fight for their allies and retreat. And that message in a boomerang way is what brought about the Abraham Accords. And those countries, particularly the Sunni Muslim countries uh, in the Middle East who are worried about Shia non-Arab Iran, um, turned to the next biggest power in the area, which was Israel. Um, and they were sort of forced to do that because they now knew that Trump was not going to come and defend them or America was not going to come and defend them. So in an ironic way, in different ways, Obama's withdrawal or, or, or uh, you know, um, meaningless threats about retaliation and Trump's um, stated intention of withdrawing from the area left the other countries turning to Israel. And that um, means that, I mean, I mean, what, what more could we want from America in this current immediate issue? We've got the diplomatic cover, and sometimes, you know, Trump was undoubtedly supportive of Israel without question. But the problem was that when he supported something, you know, 90% of the world leadership opposed it. Now, when somebody from, it, it's much more powerful support coming from the left, uh, because Biden brings along with him, as I tried to show you, so many more countries of support. Um, but at the end of the day, had Trump been the president, Israel would have had, Israel got as long as it wanted to achieve the aims it wanted. It's getting resupplied. I don't think there's any difference. And I think it actually, we got better PR by Biden supporting us, ironically, than, than Trump. But uh, at the end of the day, no difference. To this, we don't know what happens after this. The big difference between Trump and Biden is the biggest danger, which is what's going to happen with Iran, right? So we don't know the answer to that. Okay, thanks, Ron. Another one from Sue Hofbauer. Yep. Don't you think that Biden's return to the Iran deal and giving back billions to the Palestinian Authority has emboldened Hamas to attack Israel? This they dared not do under Trump. I don't think so. Firstly, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas hate each other more than they hate us almost. Um, so 
supporting one. No, I don't, I don't think so. The biggest issue with Iran is going to be the deal. You have to understand that most of the Israeli military establishment wants a deal. It just doesn't want the Obama deal, right? Uh, Trump's sanctions were very good. But again, you're talking about a country where the leadership doesn't care about the suffering of its people. So the sanctions were hurting the people, um, but it wasn't causing a upheaval in Iran. You know, we've waited for decades. We've always said, you know, one day the Iranian people will revolt and get rid of their leadership. It just hasn't happened. Um, so the importance of Iran is that, ironically, again, Hezbollah may not have entered on the instructions of Iran because Iran didn't want to screw up a deal. Uh, because had uh, Hezbollah entered at the instigation of Iran, it's quite possible that Biden would have walked away from a deal. So there are circles within circles, but we can only speculate about it. Um, but at the moment, the biggest danger for Israel is Biden going for a deal. If he goes for a deal, that's just simply the Obama deal. And unfortunately, here's the negative with Biden, most of the people he's put in charge of the deal or negotiating the deal are the same people that uh, worked under the Obama regime because he's two key appointments for us. Uh, one is um, as, uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State. Firstly, he's Jewish. That doesn't always help. But this guy is very pro-Israel and his stepfather was the, the great Holocaust survivor, Samuel Pizar. Um, and he's a close friend of Israel. And the Secretary of Defense, uh, Austin, is also a strong supporter of Israel. So we, we get a mixed bag with um, uh, the, uh, the Biden, I think, with the Biden administration. I think with the Trump administration, we didn't have to wake up in the morning and worry. With the Biden administration, we have to worry. Um, but as I say, in this 11 days, two weeks, and until this point in time, might change. Um, he's given us everything that we could possibly hope for. Thanks, Ron. And from Margaret Perlman, my non-Jewish friends often raise the inequalities between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. What are they? So there are inequalities. They're not inequalities in the ability to vote. They have the free vote. There's no, not inequalities before the law. Uh, I mentioned it in, during the talk that the two inequalities are the Israeli Arab towns are, have a huge problem with crime, with organized crime of Israeli Arab gangs. And until now, the Israeli police were unwilling to enter these towns to try and clean up these gangs because it would have looked like, as I said during the presentation, you know, Jews going in and beating up Arabs. That's what it would look like on our screens. We'd have another public relations night. And Israeli Arab mayors and Mansour Abbas from the Ram Party have made it one of their two demands, that the police will come into the Israeli Arab towns and clean them up. It's quite an amazing thing. They want a better quality of life. So that's an inequality that at one level that we didn't you know, create on purpose, let's say, but it's certainly an inequality. The other inequality um, is that there's no question that Israeli Arab towns have poor infrastructure, uh, poor access to health, you know, one thing that the pandemic showed us, I mean, we're sitting here talking about the rockets. Now, those rockets were terrible. They were terrifying. 13 people died. When you consider the potential damage, that thankfully was minimal. But in the year leading up to these rockets, over 6,000 Israelis died from COVID. Over 6,000. That's more than twice as many that died in the Yom Kippur War. But what COVID did do it showed the impact of Israeli Arabs in the health system. How many nurses and doctors, Israeli Arabs, were working in these hospitals with Jews. It brought the communities together. It, in a, in a strange way, laid the groundwork for this uh, reconciliation. But the Israeli Arab nurse went back to the Israeli Arab town and there was a disparity in their standard of living. And ironically, Mansour Abbas's it's not ironic when you understand the Middle East, but it looks ironic from the outside. Mansour Abbas's first choice of partner was Bibi Netanyahu. He wanted to join with the right wing of Israel because the right wing in Israel has a history from Jabotinsky times for equality across the board. That's not the Labour Party, uh, sorry, that was not the founding Labour Party policy it is today, but it wasn't. And so um, they had the most hope and Netanyahu was promising uh, and he, by the way, uh, both Sharon and Netanyahu increased the amount of money going to Israeli Arab towns, but not by enough. 
And so here was the opportunity to come forward and to um, demand, uh, if you like, from Mansour Abbas, but also Israelis were willing to give. The Israeli government, whether it's Lapid or Netanyahu or whoever, wants better quality of life in Israeli Arab towns. So it's very two material things, better quality of life from the lack of crime um, and uh, of, of crime of Arabs, organized crime, uh, but better infrastructure. And it's about time that that happened. Thanks, Ron. Uh, we still have a few more questions. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Bogner, tomorrow night on Q&A, Randall will speak against facts by calling them Jewish propaganda. If there are no speakers to answer again, then gross misinformation will come forth. Is the only option to email into the program? Or why can't you jump on, Ron, tomorrow? That's my added info. <laughs> We need you on. All right. So if you want to see the debate, at least you'll get the previous debate, which could happen tomorrow. But at the end of the day, our target isn't random. Our target is the people who are going to be watching this program. And it will do us damage. There's no question about it. Dave Sharma will be magnificent. Dave Sharma was in 2014, as you've all heard many times, in the last uh, rocket fight, had to go into the bomb shelters. Then he was the ambassador to Israel. He'll talk about his cat that he had to drag down into because he couldn't control the cat, whatever, personal stories. But at the end of the day, Dave Sharma represents the electorate of Wentworth. He does not represent the Jewish community. And he will be restricted in mm. going as far as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, my information is that we have requested, and I've been following this all day today, we had requested um, some Jewish representative to be on the panel. Of course, being Jews, then we'd argue about who should be on the panel, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, uh, they have rejected that. Um, we, we have an official rejection for that the panel is full, but the, a representative of the Jewish community can stand up and give a one minute something from the audience. We rejected that. Um, you know, you just look like a, I mean, Rand will be sitting up there, not, not just her, there'll be others there. Um, and um, yeah, it's the ABC. And the only good thing we can say is that, um, and I used to be an avid watcher of Q&A, since it moved to Thursday, since it changed hosts, its ratings have dropped dramatically. And even Sky News, or Sky, has a higher, uh, at that time of day, uh, more people watching it than Q&A. And if you, you know, it, you know, it's like the two Jews that met during the Holocaust, and one's happy and one's sad. And so the happy one, uh, the sad one says to the happy one, happy to be so happy. He says, oh, I read all the German press, you know, the Jews control the world, the Jews are the big thing. And the sad one, he reads the Jewish press, you know, and everybody's against us. So you can watch Sky News or Sky if you want to get a positive thing. Um, but at the end of the day, talking in our own echo chambers and just watching Sky doesn't tell us about the real world, just as Q&A doesn't tell us about the real world. And we're out there to try and convince people that we pretty much have no choice um, and I thought the front cover of the Jewish News uh, last week was pretty amazing when I quoted Golda Meir, and I'll not quote, I'll mangle the quote, but uh, basically if it's a choice between being alive and having bad PR, we choose being alive. You know, it, we're not the ones who need to commit national suicide. But what I'm trying to say is, and what I try to bring in the end, uh, is that as bad as we think the PR is, it's not. It's not. It could get worse, and social media eventually might influence the political level. But I tried to give you just some examples. I actually cut my talk down to reduce the example. But there's so many examples of positive support from Western governments around the world. And the most amazing thing is the UAE, uh, Bahrain. Bahrain is a, is a um, Shiite-led, uh, a Sunni, uh, sorry, a Sunni leadership with a Shiite population. The Shia are closely aligned to Iran. What did you hear from these people? They're cutting off relations? No. Now, of course, they can't come out and say, kill the Palestinians. But the Palestinians are no longer, and that's their biggest problem, they're no longer, of course, celeb for Arab countries. And well, that's Trump's, I mean, if you want to look at his biggest achievement, he offered them a deal that wasn't the greatest deal. They didn't come back and negotiate. He said, right, screw you. We're going to jump over you and other Arab countries are gonna make a deal. And now we've got six Arab countries that have made peace with Israel, whether it's real peace, not real peace with some of them, you know, we can argue that, but not one of them is breaking off uh, relations with Israel. Not one of them is uh, castigating Israel, leading United Nations condemnations. So, you know, maybe for us, that's as good as success is, but that's not bad. 
Thanks, Ron. And John Lewis, if Hamas is a terrorist entity, why did the UK allow them to demonstrate? If Hamas is a terrorist entity, why does Israel supply Gaza with, you know, those tunnels that were built, were built with Israeli concrete? You know where they get the rockets from? Egypt, which has part of the border with Gaza, is much stricter at stopping stuff going in than Israel is. So, you know, Israel sends in sewage pipes and plumbing pipes and they turn them into rockets. So does Israel stop doing that? No, even during these two weeks, Israel kept sending in aid through the crossings. Now, it can look ridiculous to us, but you have to understand that people who know much more about the situation, who are sitting there at the top of the country, military officials, intelligence officials, and not the least of which the prime minister, believe that it's important for Israel to continue to supply them with material. The main game will be how to work with Biden um, in trying to make sure it goes to the PA. But, you know, 20 years ago, I gave a speech once in the community that we're going to miss Arafat one day. And I got sort of laughed off the stage. But can you imagine the, the craziness that here we are begging the world to support the PA rather than Hamas? I mean, it's not like the PA are angels. It's not like the PA want to do any deal with us. It's not like we can trust the PA, the Palestinian Authority. And yet, we don't have the choice of, you know, we do sitting in Australia thinking about, you know, a theoretical world, but we don't have the choice um, between somebody better and somebody worse uh, outside of that arena. We've only got the people who are there. You know, uh, Netanyahu's father was Jabotinsky's secretary. You know, there's a real pedigree there. He died at the um, ripe uh, old age of 102, but the last article he ever wrote, he was a right-wing revisionist historian. He was a complete academic theory, never held a political actual position in his life. And at 100, he wrote an article. He didn't write the headline, but he wrote an article. And the article, the, the editor of the paper wrote on the headline, don't trust my son. So he wrote an article about his son. He didn't really say, don't trust my son. He said, my son is the best political Israel, uh, leader Israel can have. But as a politician, he's going to have to make compromises. And every compromise will be bad for Israel. So it's a big difference being an academic or sitting in the ivory tower or watching from here. And, you know, as every prime minister of Israel says, Sharon said it when he was there too, the world looks different from here. The situation looks different from here. So there's a reason that we want the people to live a better life in Gaza. That's a strategic interest of ours. Unfortunately, it's not a strategic interest of Hamas. And Hamas is able to control the people of Gaza by um, just despotic dictatorship means. When they had the fight with Fatah, they threw them off the roofs of buildings, they machine gunned them to death, and Fatah left the Palestinian Authority. So you're not dealing with New Zealand, right? And that's really the problem. But that's the problem that they have to deal with. And at the end of the day, we are going to continue to supply them with medicines, with food. I mean, for the United Nations representative, the head representative in Gaza to say there is no crisis of water or food or medicines. There's a reason for that. And it's certainly not because Hamas is buying them. Now, you know, that's the situation that Israel's in. And at the end of the day, as Jewish people, we don't just have to satisfy the world, we have to satisfy ourselves with a level of morality that I don't know if other countries would fall, come to or not. It's not my decision about other countries. But we can be proud of the fact of the moral decisions that Israel takes. And we shouldn't be bullied by Randa or other people into believing that Israel is immoral. At the end of the day, one of the quotes I didn't show was a quote by Yossi Klein Halevi, where he said the real problem is not that people are questioning the morality of Israel, but really the argument of those people is they're questioning the morality of Israel's existence. And that is like for Hamas the end game, for people to question whether the state of Israel shouldn't exist. And we can't allow that. So um, I think we have to keep, as I said, our narrative. We have to have confidence enough that we know what Israel is doing is mostly correct, if not always correct, and to understand that it doesn't matter what those triggers were that set this off, why Hamas just took opportunity for them. Their real nightmare was that the Israeli Arab party, the descendant of the Muslim Brotherhood, has come to a different realisation than them and wants integration and so forth. And I saw a question saying, is he sincere and can you believe him?
can't answer that. I can only repeat he's a dentist, but you know, is he sincere and can you believe him? I don't know. But what I can tell you is that this test, he's come through extremely well. Now he hasn't changed his party platform, just like Bibi Netanyahu hasn't changed the liquid platform. Nobody holds to their party platforms, but he has just that symbolic thing that he did by visiting the mayor of Lod. Now the mayor of Lod is a Likud kippah wearing Jew. This is one of the main flashpoints of the Arab Jewish rights, right? And the fact that Mansour Abbas goes to visit the kippah wearing Likudnik, who's the mayor of Lod, and tells and condemns the Arab violence, he didn't condemn Arab violence, he condemned all the violence, um, is pretty amazing. And the fact that he didn't say, right, end of story, not joining any government. I mean, he may not join a government because it's also now hard for um, some of the Israeli part, uh, Zionist parties to include him in, right? So I don't know. I'm very hopeful. I think that he's behaved extremely pragmatically. Um, and I think that he's uh, changed the direction uh, up until this um, two weeks. Uh, of the Israeli Arab uh, society's desires in Israel. And I think that that is huge. And I think that that is what Hamas also realized and did everything in its power to stop. Whether they were successful, we'll see. Thank you, Ron. We've got a couple more questions uh, from Jackie Rodenstein. Do you believe Mansour Abbas's words about wanting equality between Arabs and Jews? He has never walked back or rejected the Southern Islamic movement's objectives of Palestinians' right of return. Right, so I, I sort of answered that question, but I'll give it to you in a different way. The Likud platform, right? The Likud platform uh, doesn't allow for a two-state solution. Bibi Netanyahu has never looked at the liquid platform. Yeah, you know, he speaks annexation, annexation, annexation. When President Trump was there, and who stopped annexation? President Trump and Bibi Netanyahu. I mean, he could have annexed even something symbolic. He annexed zero. So, you know, there's the platform, and then there's what they're doing. I, I prefer to judge Mansour Abbas by um, his deeds and the and his behaviour. Um, and so far. Um, it's been exemplary. I can't guarantee it will continue. Um, I can't guarantee that he'll be alive. I mean, he's a, he's a threat to the Palestinians, or to Hamas, I should say, not to the Palestinians, um, because he's also um, leaving behind, he's doing what Trump did, basically, and he's leaving behind the Palestinians and just looking for the rights of Israeli Arabs and the lifestyle of Israeli Arabs. Um, and, you know, that should put him in some form of danger. Um, but uh, he's there and he's still out there in the public and he's sticking to what he said. So, so far, so good, Jackie. Um, whether it can continue, we'll have to have that discussion in a few months' time. Thanks, Ron. Um, okay, another question. Why exactly do people think Israel is ethnically cleansing, apartheid state, etc.? Is there any element of truth to this at all? And when we're, um, how are we meant to respond when challenged with this argument? So certainly not, and certainly not, and certainly not today. Um, you know, um, some people will argue about the war of independence. Um, but even then, I will firmly say no, it was no ethnic cleansing. As I'm saying, moving squatters out of a house in Sheikh Jarrah because they don't pay their rent. I mean, I'm sure there's a few property holders here on this line. Um, if people don't pay rent, you'll go to court and have them chucked out. But you're not having them chucked out of Israel. You're not cleansing Israel of these people. You're just telling them, you know, go. you can't live here if you don't pay rent. And if you want to pay rent, you can live somewhere else or buy a house or do anything. They're not being ethnically cleansed. It is the classic um, simplification of the issue. Um, there is zero ethnic cleansing um, in Israel. Um, and I mean, th we have the opposite problem. The opposite problem is, um, and I tell this story often, you know, Khalid Abu Tama is an Israeli Arab reporter. And when, um, you know, he first met a previous foreign minister or when she uh, first came to Israel, it's a long time ago now, but innocently she said, Khaled, you know, when um, uh, there's a Palestinian state, you're going to move there, aren't you? And he looked at her and he said, are you crazy? He said, I'm a journalist. And she said, so? He said, well, firstly, there's no such profession in any Arab country. 
because you, you have to just be the mouthpiece of the government. And he said, secondly, I'm an Israeli Arab. I'm going to stand here and complain about the garbage collection. I want to complain about the roads. I'm going to complain a lot, but I'm an Israeli Arab. So what you have, what the Israel's problem is, um, a little bit like Australia's in one way, is you have people wanting to come into Israel. So not, they're not being ethnically cleansed. You have Palestinians, you have Sudanese, you have people from all over Africa who want to come and live in Israel for the better quality of life and for the fact that they won't be discriminated against. You want to be gay? Try and be gay in Gaza. You know, this is one of the ironies of, uh, or a feminist. What, you know, how many rights do you think women uh, and these minority groups have in Gaza? Like zero. Come to Israel, you can do and be whatever you want. So many people, the truth is that the propaganda is at one level, but people vote with their feet. People, Israeli Arabs are not leaving Israel to move to the West Bank or to Jordan or to Egypt. The, the migration is in the opposite direction. The work is in Israel. The quality of life is in Israel. And ironically, as Khaled Abutame told Julie Bishop, as an Arab, I have more rights in the Jewish state, which he called it, the Jewish state, than in any Arab state. And I think that that's a powerful thing that we should understand. And just because Rand or anybody else calls, throws the term around ethnic cleansing, nobody in power around the world buys that. And I mean, these six families from Sheikh Jarrah are not being ethnically cleansed. It's a property dispute. The High Court has made a decision that they can be evicted simply because they haven't paid rent for 20 years. And the rent was a peppercorn rental. Um, and they're not being chucked out of the country. They can move next door and rent the house next door. No problem at all. Thanks, Ron. Just going back to when you were talking about before about Hezbollah and Lebanon not getting involved, etc. cetera, um, I think it was Sheridan that mentioned the idea of it could be um, a game in terms of seeing how far the missiles can reach and that it's actually getting now into the heart of Tel Aviv and they're just waiting, waiting, waiting um, while they're watching. And it's kind of like a test. Is that... Look, I, rec I respect Red Sheridan. Um, if anything, what the test showed was that firstly, Hezbollah have about 140,000 missiles and they're all longer, stronger, more accurate than Hamas's. And there's no doubt that the rockets from the north, from Hezbollah, can hit all over Israel. Uh, what we saw was that Iron Dome, which is magnificent, but it's not perfect. And we think about 10% of the rockets got through. What we could have been tested, if you wanted to do a test, um, would have been simultaneously rockets coming from Hamas and rockets coming from the north, uh, which would have definitely meant that Iron Dome would have been less than 90% successful. The casualty rate would have been much higher in Israel and the response would have been much stronger. Um, I, I, from what I understand, um, Iran didn't unleash Hezbollah for one of two possible reasons. Uh, I think I alluded to it before. One was because it maybe had an eye on Biden uh, and the deal coming up and didn't want to prejudice that. Uh, and the other is that Israel uh, has made very clear, and it's a believable, it's believed in Lebanon, that, I mean, Lebanon is a failed state. And Israel has made clear that if Lebanon allows or Hezbollah unleash from Lebanon, that Israel will flatten. Uh, and Israel has the ability to do so. It's terrible that it has to threaten that. Um, but um, that's a threat that's believed. Um, in. You have to also remember that Echad Ahmed, who at that time was considered a leftist, um, managed that war incredibly well. He's also had no worries about going to destroy the Syrian nuclear reactor. Um, so people are serious. If Hezbollah unleash, I mean, there could be many more casualties. For Israel, the problem isn't the military problem, as I keep saying, but it's um, keep putting up with the casualties that undoubtedly Israel would suffer and potentially um, the public relations campaign, which has the effect of limiting Israel's ability. So it's a, it's, it doesn't lack in military capability. Uh, it, it lacks in the ability to actually uh, be able to utilize it fully, if I put it that way. But I would say as a negative from the Israel point of view is, not vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, um, but vis-a-vis -vis both Hamas and the West Bank or Yudav Shomron, whichever terms you like, 
is that Israel doesn't have a strategy. And that's Israel's biggest weakness. The strategy of, they call it mowing the grass in Israel when it comes to Gaza. You know, like every few years you have to go in and just cut the grass back and you buy some period of time. Nobody knows how long that calm is. And it's not up to us when that calm ends. It's up to Hamas. It's not in our hands. And once it's not in our hands, we lose strategic advantage. And when it comes to the West Bank, Yudav Shamron, nobody is willing to, nobody who's in power, when they're in power, is willing to come up with a strategy. What is the future vision of Israel for this area and the people who live in it? And then to stick to some sort of a strategy. We've been living with the status quo, but the status quo is not um, helping us. Uh, and again, then it's out of our hands. So do we want, as Lapid says, to keep all of the major settlement blocks, build as much as we can in those blocks, but stop building outside of those blocks? Do we want the Naftali Bennett plan, which is to annex Area C. I mean, nobody in Israel wants to annex the whole of the West Bank because that would mean taking two or three million Palestinians with it. So Naftali Bennett only wants to annex Area C and leave them with some sort of autonomous area in Area A and B, what we call the state minus. Is that a plan? Um, Bibi Netanyahu has never expressed a plan. Um, and he's Israel's master strategist and he's been, of course, prime minister for so many years. So I think that's Israel's biggest disadvantage because politically inside of Israel, there are consequences for anybody who comes up with a plan. And sometimes it's easier just to say, we'll manage the situation. I don't know if we can always manage the situation um, without having to think of actually an ultimate strategy. Thank you. And our last question from Neely Berger, do you think Mansour Abbas will be able to influence the current internal conflict? Yes but he will have to get something for it, right? And what I tried to say before is that um, Israel, the Zionist parties are very happy to pay the price. Uh, and the price is money. Um, it's not about representation. You know, you know people want to talk about Israel being an apartheid state. I mean, there are some ex-South Africans on this call. They know exactly what apartheid actually means. But you know, when you can have an Israeli Arab high court judge send an Israeli Jewish president to jail, that, that doesn't fit in with any apartheid, uh, apartheid model. Um, so the problem is um, both Mansour Abbas, Netanyahu and Lapid would like to bring Mansour Abbas into the government. The question is, I should say, not the problem, but the question is, can it be done now? Um, there are Israeli parties, like some of Netanyahu's allies, Bezal Smotrich, for instance, who will leave the government if Mansour Abbas comes in. So then that doesn't get you 61 seats either. So there are political calculations to make, but if Mansour Abbas uh, stays alive, and if Mansour Abbas continues to behave as he has during these riots, there are now joint demonstrations in Israel, joint Jewish Arab demonstrations of people marching down the streets about coexistence. Everybody understands that um, that this is a huge, I mean, this is rupture in the fabric of Israeli society, right? And everybody understands on both sides that it needs to be uh, fixed. The problem is who else might try and interfere? Because Hamas has a huge interest that it doesn't happen. Um, the Palestinian Authority has an interest that doesn't happen also. Um, so it's not entirely in our hands, but there's a desire, at least at this point in time, on his part and on any Israeli Zionist, any leading Israeli Zionist party um, to bring him in. And I'll, I guess we're gonna finish, so I'll remind you of something that happened, you know, at the time of the Rabin assassination. Uh, Rabin was assassinated and then Shimon Peres became the prime minister. Now Rabin was assassinated by a kippah wearing Jew, um, not necessarily because the, I mean, the religious Zionists didn't endorse this or anything, but he was a kippah wearing Jew. And Israel could have gone one of two ways. And Shimon Peres was a genius, really, uh, in this sense. And you know, he could have, they could have ostracized the entire segment of the Jewish Israeli society and said, look, this society that produced this guy and whatever. But what he did was he brought into the government, one person that we should all learn about, is, is dead now, is Rav Yehuda Amital. Rav Yehuda Amital, Rabbi Yehuda Amital, he was the first settlement rabbi. He was a Romanian who came to the state of Israel, fought in the War of Independence. I'm not sure, but I think he was a paratrooper. 
And immediately after the Six Day War, he set up the first settlement, settlement outside of the Green Line in Gush Etzion. It's the Har Etzion Yeshiva. And he started a whole chain. He started the Hezder Army Service, combined with Yeshiva and whatever. But this guy was no politician. And yet, Shimon Peres went to him, the leading religious Zionist, and asked him to join the government to do reconciliation. And what I'm trying to say is it was so shocking that, the, that Rabin could have been assassinated by a Jew. It shocked everybody. And everybody then really realized that, stop, we have to bring something together. And I think that this rendering of the society between Jew and Arab in Israel is something that's hitting Israeli leadership in just the same way. And that therefore there will be a greater determination uh, to bring the two groups together and to try and repair the damage. But it will take time and it will take a lot of effort. And one of the problems Israel has is it doesn't have a real, it's only got interim governments. Um, so it's a little hard to, they can't pass a budget, you know, all of these sorts of things. Uh, and it's going to take money to solve uh, or to contribute to the solution of part of these problems. So there's many obstacles ahead, but one of them I don't believe is the will, the will to actually bring these two groups together. And I, and I go back again to the COVID situation uh, and you've got a fantastic picture of a, 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 it's not fantastic that the Jewish person was injured by the Arab riots, but who's, who's he thanking in the photo? The Arab nurse that's been the uh, male nurse has been the guy looking after him. And so that whole COVID picture brought people together who didn't come together before. And I think it's the negative part of COVID is negative, but I think that that's all positive uh, for the state of Israel. Thank you so much, Ron. As ever, your presentation was so thought-provoking and informative. We are so incredibly fortunate to have you available in our community. I think that this was your third or fourth this week. Oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. I was, I'm going to laugh and say that you're one millionth certif wheat so certificate is in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. That's now covering your entire house. Thank you. Um, but really, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You're an amazing meat so man, and we are so lucky to have you. And Am Yisrael Chai, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And go out and fight the good fight and be positive. Don't yeah. let it get you down. Excellent. Thank you. Well, so if you want to send me an email, if you want to get that debate, it's a, a, a sound file. Uh, but then you get a good idea, well, how badly I did, but also how uh, well uh, she puts positions and just changes them. You know, she goes from, especially if you listen to the end, you know, the Palestinians are the victims with nobody supporting them. The Palestinians are everybody supporting them. Whatever you say, just oh, water for ducks back. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Laila Tov.